Good morning, my friends. The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as we worship on this beautiful day. Have you ever been lost? So completely lost? I remember when I was a little boy, a little child, little, 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 cadence age, I mean, really young, I was at a mall in, uh, in Chattanooga with my family, and I got lost. And I tell you, when you're a little kid like that, it's scary. It's very scary. And I remember actually thinking, am I going to see my family again? I mean, it's, it's a powerful emotion uh, to be lost or to feel like you're lost. For us to come to worship today, my friends, we all are wondering where we're at in this world and what is to come. And maybe there's a little sense of misdirection, or maybe we don't know quite where we're heading. But it's good to be able to come to worship on this day and to know that we have something far better than GPS, something far better than a map, that we have the way and the truth and the life. So let us come and worship Christ our Lord. We join together in our call to worship. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. Once we lived in darkness, but now we stand in God's marvelous light. Once we had no direction, but now if I look away, the truth and the life. Amen. Our opening song, The Church is One Foundation. Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. If you will join with me to affirm our faith. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. My soul is refreshed and renewed and given the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and anoint my head with oil until it overflows. 
Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Jesus says, Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you all this time, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells, dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord, and we can trust it. Thanks be to God. Now I invite you to join with me in singing hymn, um, We Believe in One True God.
You know, my friends, it's not, it's not too easy getting lost these days. I mean, it's possible, but we have all this wonderful technology that kind of goes with us, technology that's mobile, that can help give us a good path. And I'm thinking of things like smartphones, and GPS, even in our cars we have GPS technology. We even have Google Maps, all of this technology at our disposal. But before we had all that technology, do you know what we had? We had this. And you know what this is? Cadence probably never seen one of these before. I don't know. Lauren, I don't know if you've ever seen one. Yeah, you have seen one of these. It's a map, right? You had to pull it out and use it, right? This is what you had before all of our wonderful technology. You, you had paper maps. And, and back in the day, people actually used paper maps to get around. And if the paper map didn't work, there was a backup to it. And you know what that was? The corner gas station. Because there was a time when, yes, people would actually stop to ask someone for directions. It used to happen. But back in the day, it, it, it could be confusing depending on the type of directions you got. I mean, it could have been, well, this is how you get there. What you do is you go down country road such and such, and, and you turn left at the old Thompson farm. And you go down that road until you see that oak tree that was hit by lightning back in 73, and that's where you turn right. Uh, things are different today, right? Things are so different today. Now you have Google Maps, you have GPS, you have smart devices. You, you even have in your car or on your phone devices that give you step-by-step -step voice instructions. So you have all this technology, but there will always be the benefit of having someone in the car with you. Set aside all the technology, set aside all the maps. If you have someone in the car with you giving you step-by-step -step directions, that gives you an assurance nothing else can do. And that's what we find in our reading from John's Gospel. It's more than just having someone tell us the way. What we see here in John 14 is that Jesus is the way. He is the way and the truth and the life. And so here we are looking at John's gospel. And at this point in the story in John's gospel, Jesus just celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples. He washed their feet in an act of great servanthood, and he spoke about the betrayal from one of his own. Jesus predicted Peter's denial and told the disciples that he would be leaving. And it's during these moments that Jesus offers this word of hope. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. And Jesus is saying this because of the hardships that are to come. And, and you know, we all go through hardships. We all have moments in life that are difficult, painful, just difficult, hard moments to get through, like this pandemic. We all go through them. And, and when you go through a hardship, that pain has a way of getting your attention. It's very difficult to not realize you're going through a hardship. But you know what else it does? That, that hardship, that pain has a tendency to slow us down. Pain slows us down. And it has a way of even changing us. When you enter into a hardship, when you go through a difficult time, it's very unlikely you're going to end up the same person on the other end. And so Jesus is thinking about all of this, and he's really trying to prepare his disciples for the horror and the discouragement and the shock that they are about to see with the crucifixion. He's trying to prepare their hearts for the rough road ahead. And Jesus wants them to know, first of all, that if you have faith, you will overcome your worry. 
If you have faith, you will overcome your worry. Now, some people may think that's impossible. Is it really possible to overcome all worry? Is that even, is, is it possible? Is it likely? Can you do it? My answer is I think it's essential in our walk of faith to overcome our worry. And I think we can with Jesus. You've heard me talk about this time and time again. I think it's essential to remove worry from our walk of faith. It's, it's, yes, we are concerned about things. Yes, there are things that, that focus our attention and our energy and our resources. It's one thing to be concerned about something. It's different to worry about it. And so I think Jesus is saying, if you have faith, you will be able to overcome your worry. And, and, and so I think it's essential to live a life free of worry. Because worry, what does worry do? I'll tell you one thing that worry will always do. It will distort our reality. Worry will distort our reality. How we see things. Or, or when we worry, we do a lot of anticipation. Oh, this is going to happen. It's going to be terrible. This is going to be awful. You don't know what's going to happen, but you anticipate. And, and, and it even warps your sense of reality and how things are unfolding. Worry can lead to false conclusions. An example. It's kind of a joke. But there was this commercial airline, 747, big, beautiful plane, international flight. They're flying. Everything's wonderful. But all of a sudden, the pilot comes over the radio. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this, is your, this is your pilot speaking. Uh, we have uh, just lost one of our engines. Everything is fine, and it just means that we will be one la hour late to our, uh, to our arrival. Everything's okay. About 30 minutes later, Ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot again. We've lost a second engine. We apologize for this inconvenience. So now we will be arriving about two hours, two hours behind schedule. Everybody's okay. Everybody's just flying along. About an hour later, ladies and gentlemen, yes, it's your captain again. Uh, it seems we've lost our third engine. We will now be late by a good four hours. One of the passengers turns to her husband and says, oh my gosh, now I'm starting to worry. Because if we lose that fourth engine, we're going to be up here all night. There are laughs here, so you got to laugh with that. If, here's the point. If you want to be distracted from reality, then get yourself worked up with worry. That's what worry does. If Jesus had any concerns, he was concerned that his disciples would work themselves up into all this worry that would distract them and distract reality. So let's look at the story. So Jesus just finished having the Last Supper with his disciples. You know, this is Thursday evening of Holy Week. Jesus only has a few more hours before he is apprehended, arrested, interrogated, crucified. He's only got a few moments left. And if anyone has reason to worry, it's Jesus. But what does he do? He brings calm and peace to the situation, right? He looks at his disciples who just watched Judas leave in his act of betrayal. And Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot come but do not let your hearts be troubled. He then tells them to not be afraid. And at this moment, the tension is so thick that you could cut it with a knife. And it's then that Jesus says that there is a haven for those with troubled hearts in his father's mansion, and there's plenty of room for everyone. And then Jesus spends his final moments here calming their fears. And I love that, how he's trying to calm the situation. And so in John, you have chapters 14, 15, 16, 
17 record the after-dinner conversation between Jesus and the disciples. And it's a good conversation because in it, Jesus makes some powerful promises. First, he says, yes, I am leaving, but do not let your hearts be troubled because I am sending the Holy Spirit to remind you and to help you remember everything that I have taught you. He then makes a second promise, peace that the world gives or tries to give. This is my peace that I give to you. Then there's a third promise. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled because I am the vine and you are the branches. You will bear fruit as long as you abide in me. So make me your strength for your life. Then Fourth, and this is wonderful, Jesus says, I love you. Have you ever had someone tell you that God loves you? If not, then I hope that you hear this now, even through this internet. Hear this. This is the truth, that Jesus loves you. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus loves you. In case you haven't heard that, I want you to hear it today. And then Jesus is pretty blunt. and He says, you know, the world is going to hate you. But don't worry about that because I have already overcome the world. But then he's honest and he tells them that they are going to grieve when he leaves. But oh, one day, he says, that grief is going to be transformed into joy. And you know what the final thing Jesus does in in this after-dinner conversation? The last thing Jesus does is he prays. He prays for himself. He prays for his circle of disciples. And he prays for you and me. It's pretty awesome. It's a remarkable after-dinner conversation. The Gospel of John has 21 chapters, and five of them, record the Last Supper and the after-dinner conversation with Jesus and his disciples. It's, it's five chapters that focus on Thursday night of Holy Week, around the dinner table on the evening of Christ's arrest and betrayal. And because of that, Jesus, he, he wants his disciples to be ready, to be calm, to be free of a troubled heart. He wants them free of worry. He wants them to know that having faith will always give direction for your life. Do you hear that? When you have faith, it gives you direction in life. Because, my friends, there are moments in life when we have to make some really big decisions. I mean, for our younger Members and our younger people who've just finished high school, what are they going to do? Where are they going to go to college? Those are big decisions. And as they grow older, they're going to have to decide about career choices. And when they get even older, they're going to be thinking about the right person to marry and starting a family. I mean, those are, those are big decisions. And we think about our society and this quarantine and how we're trying to reopen everything in a safe and responsible manner. I mean, there's always big decisions that we have to make in life, but they pale in comparison to the decisions that we have to make regarding our faith. The decisions that we need to make regarding our priorities in life. What's the most important thing for you in your life? Is it God or is it another idol? What are your values? What does your life stand for? I mean, those are some pretty, pretty big choices that you and I have to make in our lives. Some big decisions. And we, we, we make those decisions based on our need for direction. We need our faith to help give us direction in our lives. I remember when I was the pastor in Castroville. Um, I think this was in 2005 when this happened. I did something as I was heading back 
on uh, Highway 90 back to Castorville, I did something that I know is dangerous. Do you know what I did? I picked up a hitchhiker. Have you ever done that? Have you ever picked up a hitchhiker? You have, oh, yeah. Well, some, I got a yes and a bunch of no's, right? I, I, I know it's dangerous, but I tell you it was the Holy Spirit that told me to stop and to pick this person up. His name was Michael, and he was from South Africa. And God had given him a ministry to come to the States to do evangelism. He, he came to the United States just following this call from God to, to just minister, to share the scriptures and the gospel with us. And so I, I knew when I went by him, I had to stop and pick him up. It was the Holy Spirit. And so we're, we're driving, and, and he's looking for a Lutheran church that's doing a prayer meeting that night, okay? And he pulls out his map, and he starts talking about um, his directions and where he needed to go to get to this Lutheran church. And when he started sharing his directions, I knew he was mistaken. And so he starts talking about an exit off of Highway 90 that I know is not there. But Michael is just so sure. And you know what he did? He, he pulled out his map, and he starts with a pen, starts drawing these perpendicular lines to Highway 90, and says the exit should be right in there. It's not on the map. And this is a, this is, this is a good map. He's drawing his own map on the map. He's making up these exits. It's got to be right there. It's just got to be. It's got to be right there. And I'm sitting there trying to convince him, no, 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 no. That's not right. And the point is, is that he was trying to come up with his own direction in life. Turns out he was on the wrong side of San Antonio. <laughs> He was going really, really lost. And so here's my question to you. Have you ever been so lost that you absolutely didn't know where to go? You didn't know where your next step was? Or have you been so stubborn that you thought that you knew the way, that you could just make up your own map? My friends, we need direction in life. We need direction for all of the decisions that we make. And it doesn't matter how long you have been walking in faith with Jesus. There is only one map that we need to follow in this world, and it's not a map that we try to create. It's the map. It's the way. It's the truth. It's the life that God provides for us. It's not my map. It's not your map. It's not a map from Google. It is Jesus Christ. And it's not that Jesus Christ is a map, it's that Jesus Christ is the way. He doesn't just show us the way, he is the way. He is the way and the truth and the life. Does that make sense? Jesus doesn't point us the way, he is the way. And that's why faith gives us direction in life. And there is a peace that comes from knowing that we don't have to really worry about the directions. But Christ, because Christ knows the way to the Father. Christ is the direction. He is the only direction that we ever truly need. And not only that, Jesus knows the path on that direction. He knows about the potholes. He knows about the troubled curves. He knows about the dips. He knows about the dark valleys. He knows. He knows. And he can still get us safely to where we need to be. And not only that, he knows about our tendency to, well, with temptations, he knows about our temptation to mess up the map and to draw our own map. He knows about all of this, and yet because he is the way, he can still get us to where we need to be. I don't know if you've ever read any Karl Barth. He was a German theologian, and years ago uh, he was... Uh, lecturing at the seminary at Princeton. And one of the students asked 
Karl Barth a question. He asked, Sir, don't you think that God has revealed himself in other world religions? I love Karl Barth's answer. He said, God has not revealed himself in any religion, including Christianity. God has revealed himself in his son. Think about that. God has revealed himself in his son. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And you see, that's the miracle of the incarnation, of Jesus Christ being the flesh of God. God knows the journey that we take and the journey that we need to take. God knows about the disappointments, the fears, the doubts, the pain we will experience along the way. And because of that, we can still rest assured that we're on the right path because God has given us the way in Jesus Christ. But not only that, as we follow the way, we have help along the way. Because in verse 13, Jesus said, I will do whatever you ask in my name. If you ask me anything... I will do it. Now, that's great help. But what exactly does that mean? Well, I always remember a story from Dr. Leslie Weatherhead. Shared a great story about an experience in college. He was going through a class, and it was a very difficult class, and he was coming to the final. And he was uh, really kind of worried about it, but he remembered Jesus' promise that whatever you ask in my name, I will give it. Leslie believed that verse, and all he had to do was just, you know, if I just ask, then I'm going to pass this test. And so he prayed, and he said, God, I believe in your promise, and so I ask for a good grade. He failed the class. (laughs) He failed the class. And, And it created a bit of conflict within him because he was dejected and he began to wrestle and and wonder about the promises of God. All because God had not granted him his wish for a good grade. Well, the next year, of course, he had to repeat the course and he worked hard and he passed. And at the time, he thought that he didn't need God, that he could get along all by himself. But after some years, Dr. Weatherhead came to a new understanding that his powers and his abilities were in reality the power of God that God had given to him. It was a power that God had given to him. And he began to realize that that God had given him the power to pass that course, but he had not used that power the first time around. And my point is this, is that there is power available for us to use. There is power available for us to use. Not the kind of power that lets us coast through life on autopilot. I mean, that's, that's not the kind of power that we want or that God provides. The power that God gives shapes and molds our lives. You think about Romans 12 and about the renewing of our mind. That's what I'm talking about. The power available to us shapes our lives. It's it's a help. It's the kind of help that strengthens us. It's the kind of help that, that comforts our souls when we are troubled. It gives us the ability to not worry even when we go through hardships. I mean, the kind of help That doesn't show us the way, but rather becomes our way. Hear that. That's a powerful form of help. That's great help, right? That it it doesn't just show us the way, it becomes our way because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And that kind of help, what it does is it, it helps us to do good works. It helps us, us by teaching us and strengthen us to use our good gifts to the glory of God. 
So my friends, wherever you are in this pandemic, in this quarantine, wherever you are with decisions that you're having to make, have faith who have faith in the one who is the way and the truth and the life because Jesus is the only one who can give you the faith to overcome the worries that we have in this world. It is only Christ who can give you the real direction that you need in your life and that direction comes through that relationship because only Jesus can give you the help along the way to help you live as an instrument of God's love and amazing grace. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God bless you and your relationship with Christ and your walk of faith. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, as we come to you in prayer, we know that we should be grateful because we're not crushed. I mean, we're not destroyed. We're not without help. We are actually followers of the way. We are followers of you, our Lord and Savior. So God, bless us with confidence this morning. Confidence that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Bless our confidence in the steps that we take while we are on your path. Because as we listen to you, as we trust you, As we follow you, how could we ever be on the wrong path? So bless our confidence that you are with us and that you are leading us through this pandemic. We pray that you help us to open our communities safely again. Give us the confidence and the healing we need to overcome this virus. Give our local businesses the confidence that commerce will return. Because God, this is our prayer. And on this day, we give thanks for the gift of mothers. Only you, Lord, could create something as sacred and special as the job of a mother. And whether we remember or honor our mothers this day, we give you thanks for the blessings that we did receive from them. We thank you, God, for the blessings we receive every day and for the awesome miracle of your salvation. We give you our thanks. We give you our praise as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, we're going to sing our closing song, I'll Fly Away.
friends, I want to take just a moment to share some joys, concerns, and announcements. Uh, friends, please be in prayer for Warren Armstrong. I know you see in the bulletin there that uh, he is in Smithville. Uh, he actually had another fall while at the Towers and now has pneumonia. So we pray for Warren, uh, for Adrian, for God's healing and grace to be with them. We continue to pray for Marilyn Petrick. Uh, she has been diagnosed with the coronavirus, um, but she's been tested and it has come back this time negative. And if they can get another negative test, um, she's well enough that she can get out of that nursing home. So that is our prayer for, for Marilyn, for her family. Uh, from our prayer wall, we want to continue to pray for David Driscoll. Um, uh, he is recovering from eye surgeries. God bless you, David, if you're watching. And for Susie Casper, dear friend of Patty Ingalls, uh, recovering from knee replacement. And also for Dick Ingalls, who celebrated 90, 90th birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Um, also, uh, for uh, Kristen Cardin's dad, David, uh, undergoing stem cell treatments right now. And so that's a, an update on Kristen's dad. Let me tell you some announcements on what's going on as we uh, look to uh, opening the church again. We have our Wednesday service, and it's a prayer service. We are going to open that up starting this Wednesday. Okay, so if you want to come to church on Wednesday evening, we start at 6 o'clock. We're, st we're still going to live stream. We're going to do both. But if you want to come to church, uh, we're going to start this way and open up church on Wednesdays only. And then we're looking at May 24th as the first Sunday to go back to our two services uh, on Sunday. We will still, still live stream the 9 a.m. service uh, on Sunday morning. So I uh, just want to give you an update. If you want to come to church on Wednesday, we'd love to see you. We'd love to, for you to be here. Uh, and then we're looking for May 24th. Unless something changes, that's the date that we're shooting for. But my friends, go now with the strength of this benediction. Have you ever felt lost? It's okay. Just know that you have something better than GPS. You have something better than a map. And you know, you don't even have to worry about folding this up. I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask Lauren to fold that up. I don't even know how to fold it up. So, my friends, you have something better than all of that. You have the way and the truth and the life. You have Jesus Christ. How can you be lost when the one who is with you is the way? Jesus is with you. And the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen.